Hi everyone, this is the big one for your macro exams this year covering core UK economy stats in 2023. Your job is to take down all these stats, to sprinkle them in your macro essays, but also to use this information to weigh up arguments that you're making. It's a way to score even higher marks and push towards the top grades. But this video is so important. Please do me a favor and share it with anybody you think is going to benefit. Your friends, other students, yes, but also just generally people who are interested in how the UK economy is doing. This information is so important to know of the UK economy and stats crucial at the moment. So please share this video to anybody that you think will benefit. And note that this video is one in my revision for 2023 exams playlist. Many other videos have been uploaded already, many more to come, videos geared towards making you perfect in your revision, ready for your exams this year. So great you're watching this one, but make sure you're watching all the others in that playlist too. So let's get into it, starting by looking at economic growth in the UK. Well, annual growth in 2022 was 4.1%, a healthy figure, following a 7.6% growth rate in 2021. But bear in mind, the UK was coming out of its worst recession in over 300 years. In 2020, the UK economy contracted by 11%. So high growth rates in 2021-2022, but coming from a very low base. Still a strong recovery. More disappointing is our current growth figures. You can see that in quarter four of 2022, the UK economy only grew by 0.1%, but far more concerning is our annual growth forecast for this year. We are forecast to shrink by 0.2%. Yes, we have very high inflation eating in to cost of living, massively rising cost of living, driven by supply side shocks. Initially, very high oil prices, more recently, high gas, electricity prices, and very high food prices. Are those supply side shocks really eating into the cost of living, harming economic growth? And on the demand side, low consumer confidence, low business confidence, affecting consumption and investment, but also contractionary demand side policies, contractionary fiscal, contractionary monetary policies. These are all reasons why this year our economy is forecast to shrink. Together with Germany, we are the only major economies forecast to shrink this year, not looking good on the growth side at all. Hence why we're expected to have a large negative output gap later this year. We already are in a negative output gap situation, but that is the projected peak, a negative output gap of 1.6%. How is that percentage formulated? Well, this is actual GDP as a percentage of potential GDP. So we've actually had a positive output gap for the last two years. Um, supply side constraints, very high demand, a tight labor market has driven a positive output gap, but all of those conditions are now easing. Supply side constraints are easing, waning demand, a loosening labor market is why we have a negative output gap and that is projected to rise. Good to know that, peaking at this figure by quarter three of this year. Our GDP per capita, that is average income per head, per person, is £33,000. Our total GDP is around £2.4 trillion, but good to know the breakdown. 79% of that is from the services sector, 14% from manufacturing, 6% construction, 1% agriculture. So we're a very services-dominated economy, unbalanced growth in that regard. Let's now move to unemployment. The unemployment rate in the UK is quite low at 3.8%, a sign of a labor market working quite well, a labor market that's quite resilient. But this is a lagging indicator with negative growth rates forecast this year, a larger negative output gap as well. We're expecting this figure to rise and to peak at something like 4.5% later in the year. The employment rate, that's those people of a working age who are in work, is 75.8%. More interesting is the economic inactivity rate. This is people of a working age, so age between 16 and 64 years old, who are either not willing to work, not physically able to work, or who are not seeking work. That figure is 21.4%, a figure that's risen during COVID times, driven mainly by those people in their 50s and 60s who have not returned back to the workforce since the COVID pandemic. There have been targeted supply side policies used to try and bring these guys back, but as it stands, that figure has risen. A good figure to know there. Youth unemployment has come well down to 10.8%. That figure peaked at 14.5% at the heart of the COVID crisis. But a strong services rebound as well as targeted policies to bring this figure down have been quite effective, hence why the figure is quite low now. Long-term unemployment, that's those people who have been out of work for a year or more, is very lower, only 1%, very healthy figure there. 
Wage growth in the UK, annual wages growing by 6.6%. Again, a good sign of a labor market working quite well, a sign that a tight labor market we once had uh, fed through to quite stubbornly high wage growth. We've known that trade unions in the UK have been very, very strong, striking, demanding significant increases in their pay. But just more generally, especially in the private sector, wage growth has been very, very healthy. Having said that, still below the rate of inflation. So in real terms, wages are still negative. Hence why consumer confidence is very low. High inflation, significantly rising cost of living negative growth rates forecast, rising unemployment forecast is all eating into very low consumer confidence. There are signs, fragile signs, that there is a small recovery coming in consumer confidence, but it's too early to guarantee that very low is really where we are at the moment, to be honest. Uh, and job vacancies, a sign here, the labor market is loosening. We had a record high number of job vacancies last year in a very tight labor market, but unemployment rising, we're expecting that means job vacancies are now coming down. Firms are less willing to hire with negative growth rates forecast with generally waning demand in the UK. So we're already seeing job vacancies falling at the moment, representing a looser labor market. Now let's move to inflation, shall we? Inflation is super scary in the UK economy at the moment. You can see that the inflation rate is 10.1% using the CPI measure, way beyond the target rate of 2%. In fact, this is our seventh consecutive month of double digit inflation. It is unbelievable how scary these figures have been. Uh, what's been driving it? Well, mainly supply side drivers. In 2021, very high oil prices, driving up fuel prices throughout 2022, and now high gas and electricity prices, high food prices also are a major driver at the moment, but also strong wage growth and a weak pound. These are all major supply side drivers, keeping inflation stubbornly high and sticky. Inflation, high inflation is not unique to the UK. In the Eurozone at the moment, 6.9%, 5% in the US, it's been much higher in both economies. But you can see the UK is now the outlier with still double digit high rates of inflation. Inflation that's disproportionately harming those on low incomes. It is a scary picture. Fortunately, forecasts are for this to come down later in the year. Some forecasts are quite bullish, saying it can come down all the way to around 3%, but the vast majority are saying around half. So inflation somewhere between five and 6% later in the year. Still above target, but thank God if it does end up coming down. Good to know some other stats at the heart of inflation as well, like for example, core inflation. This is the Bank of England's preferred measure of inflation. It's basically the CPI, but taking out food and energy from the basket. So specifically food, gas, electricity, and fuel, very price volatile items. You're then left with the core inflation rate, which economists call the underlying rate of inflation, the general rise in price of consumer goods and services across the economy. And you can see this is 6.2%, worrying here far beyond the 2% target rate, which tells you that generally consumer goods and services are rising a lot in price. But the fact that the CPI inflation rate is greater is telling you that it's food and it's energy really at the heart driving inflation currently. Now to producer price inflation, what is this? This measures the change in price of a basket of goods as they've been manufactured, as they leave the factory gate. This is wholesale price inflation. It's one stage before retail price inflation, i.e. one stage before CPI inflation rates. And the idea is if this figure is rising, it's an indicator of rising input costs for firms, rising raw material costs, rising labor costs, rising energy costs, for example. Um, for two years, this figure has been consistently higher than the CPI inflation rate. It's an indicator of future CPI inflation rates. If the figure is higher than the CPI, we expect CPI inflation rates to go up, right? Retail prices will rise to reflect higher input costs for firms. But for once, for once, this figure is now below the CPI inflation rate. For two years, it's been above, driving increases in the CPI. Finally, it's lower. Maybe CPI inflation will start to come down. For once, this figure is guiding us saying CPI inflation rate could well come down, given that it's lower than the CPI and might go down further. 
currently at 8.7 percent and that is a great thing inflation is very scary at the moment any signs that it can come down is a very very welcome sign inflation expectations important figure here what households think inflation will be over the next 12 months 5.4 percent okay an important figure because that drives wage growth even though that is lower again a good sign it's still beyond target if wages continue to rise stubbornly greater than target that is concerning but at least that figure is lower. Uh, wage growth, we know, is quite strong, 6.6%, but negative in real terms. Food price inflation, very high at 19.1%, a major driver of high inflation at the moment. And again, the disproportionate impact on low-income households is very concerning. So general picture, inflation, a massive concern, but better signs, maybe that inflation will be coming down. It better come down, otherwise a major risk is of inflation spirals. Who would have thought that in the UK economy? But that's where we are at the moment. Let's move now to trade. The UK's current account deficit is 3.3% of GDP in size. The UK's had a current account deficit for the last three decades. The decade-long average is around 4% of GDP, and we're pretty much there again. So a high, persistent current account deficit in the UK driven by heavy, dominant supply-side factors like high unit labour costs given very poor productivity and weak business investment that erodes export competitiveness. Investment has been awful ever since we voted Brexit in 2016 and productivity shocking since the financial crisis. Uh, UK productivity is 20% below the average of the rest of the G7. The G7, the seven largest, most advanced economies in the world, the UK's productivity is 20% below the average of the rest of the G7. Shocking there. But also, since the financial crisis, UK productivity is 25% below the pre-financial crisis trend. A couple of stats that tell you just how bad productivity is. Both of these drive up uh, cost of production and erode export competitiveness at the heart of our current account deficit. The pound, very weak. To the dollar, $1.24. To the euro, one euro twelve. The pound has been weak ever since Brexit in 2016. But you might be thinking, surely that's a good thing? A weak pound or a weak exchange rate should improve the current account deficit. Well, generally, yes. But in the UK's case, the UK is a net importing country and an importer of key necessity inputs, like, for example, raw materials, like semi-finished goods, capital machinery. So a weak pound simply makes those imports more expensive and worsens our current account position. We also know the weak pound is a key driver of stubbornly high inflation in the UK too. So weak pound is causing more damage in the UK. It's not really helping to improve our current account position. Minimum wages stands at £10.42 per hour in the UK right now, a figure that's risen far more than inflation. Another reason why uh, competitiveness is low, unit labour costs are high. And what about the performance of our major trading partners, the US and Eurozone economies? Well, both of those economies are forecast to slow down considerably with growth this year. Bad news for UK export demand there as well. Let's now move on and talk about government finances. Well, government finances in the UK are in terrible shape. Our projected budget deficit for the fiscal year 2020 to 2023 is 6.1% of GDP. Remember, a budget deficit is annual government borrowing and a fiscal year in the UK is from the first week of April one year through to the first week of April the following year, projected to be 6.1% of GDP in the fiscal year just gone. Coming off two very high figures in the years prior, 14.5% of GDP budget deficit at the heart of the COVID crisis, 2020 to 2021, around £305 billion worth of government borrowing in that one fiscal year, the highest budget deficit since World War II in the UK. Following that, 5.6% of GDP. So very high figures. These last two is government borrowing of well in excess of £100 billion. <clears throat> For some context, the fiscal year prior to COVID, the UK's budget deficit was around 2% of GDP, £40 billion worth of borrowing. And go back to the financial crisis. The peak budget deficit then was £100 billion. So you can see we are well in excess of that eye-watering sums of government borrowing here. No wonder that we're currently in the process of using contractionary fiscal policy to run down these figures. But high borrowing has meant a very high national debt. National debt is the total stock of government debt, currently 100% of GDP. Prior to COVID, it was around 79% or 80% of GDP. 
Bond yields reflect the cost of borrowing for the government. This figure has risen in line with generally higher interest rates in the UK, 3.46%, meaning it's more expensive now for governments to service their debt, to pay debt interest. In fact, this year, 2023, the forecast is for the UK government to pay £116 billion just on servicing debt interest. My God, what an opportunity cost. That is more than our government spends on any public service barring the NHS. It's more than our government spends on education, for God's sake. Insane to think about it. And yes, that's why we're using contractionary fiscal policy to run down our budget deficits, to run down the national debt. The main way we're doing that is by raising taxes. So income tax, for example, is rising. Let's talk about income tax. We have a progressive income tax system in the UK where the first £12,570 worth of income is tax-free. That is the income tax-free allowance. From 12570 up to £50,270 worth of income, that's a 20% tax rate. On any income between 50, 270 and £150,000, 40% tax rate. And any income earned above £150,000 is taxed at 45%. But interesting is that these tax bans have been frozen all the way to April 2028. That is a massive tax rise, not explicitly, but by stealth. The idea is that every year, people's pay goes up, let's say in line with inflation only. So in real terms, people aren't better off. Their pay rise is simply in line with inflation. But if the tax bans in this tax system are frozen, they could easily be dragged into higher income tax bans, making them pay higher rates of income tax, and thus actually they end up being worse off. This is the phenomenon of fiscal drag, and by freezing the tax bans all the way to 2028, this is fiscal drag on steroids, isn't it? Massive fiscal drag here. Horrible news for workers at the time of a cost of living crisis makes them even more worse off, but great news for the government. Just freezing the tax bans to 2028 is expected to earn the government by 2026 around £26 billion a year more income tax revenue. Incredible to think about it, isn't it? Corporation tax has also risen as of April this year from 19% now to 25%, a significant direct tax rise there. VAT currently 20% in the UK and on Gini coefficient 0.343, an indicator of income inequality. Good to have those down. Let's finish this video by talking about interest rates. Well, the Bank of England base rate currently stands at 4.25%, a figure that's risen all the way from 0.1% in December 2021. So all throughout 2022, pretty much all throughout 2023, interest rates have risen and they've risen a lot at a time too. I'm expecting that figure to continue rising. Uh, higher interest rates are there to battle higher than target rates of inflation. Has it been working? Not at all, because we know inflation is being driven by supply side factors. Higher interest rates target the demand side of the economy. They don't help to alleviate supply side pressures. So not working at all, but the Bank of England have to be seen to be doing something. So they've been raising rates a lot. We're expecting a bit more to come in the coming months too. That has fed through to higher average lending rates by commercial banks. Not surprising that the transmission mechanism of monetary policy is working well in the upwards direction. Banks are generally very very willing to lend despite higher interest rates causing some bank failures in the banking sector. Generally speaking, banks are in a healthy position. They are willing to lend. But the bigger issue is that of consumer and business confidence, both very, very low at the moment. However, signs, gentle signs of recovery, tentative signs of recovery, especially with business confidence, Brexit uncertainty seems to be fading away. Supply side constraints are easing. Forecasts for lower inflation are helping as well. But as we speak, both very, very low. So consumers' businesses not very willing to borrow, not very willing to spend, not very willing to invest. All uh, big contributors to forecast negative growth rates this year in the UK. Savings ratio, that is the proportion of disposable income that is saved and not spent. Pretty high for UK standards at 9.3%, but not massively surprising. Right now, a major cost of living crisis. People naturally want to save just in case bills rise unexpectedly. They then have savings to pay off those bills. And lastly, quantitative easing. Total amount of QE used in the UK, £895 billion. It's around 40% of GDP, insane really. The last QE injection was during COVID times. 450 billion pounds of new money pumped into the UK economy. 
definitely sowed the seeds for inflation given how expensive that QE was. So there you have it guys, all the key UK economy stats for you to use in your macro exams this year. Hopefully you've taken all that in, use it in your essays. Yes, as application, but hopefully the wider context here as well helps you to weigh up arguments in your essays to push you to the highest marks. Remember, this is one video of many in my revision for 2023 exams playlist. Great you've watched this one, watch the others too, many more to come to help you smash your exams this year. So thank you so much for watching. I can't wait to see you in future videos. See you then, guys.